what I'd like to present, I was asked to, today to present an idea or a concept we've been working on, and I was kidding with Carl uh, the last time I saw him at a presentation. I love this, at least this time it's 35 minutes, but I love this thing where they say, you have 15 minutes, tell us about your life's work. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Okay, so the, we've been working on this for a good while. Peggy Carr is one of the most creative people I think I've ever met in my life. Um, she's a landscape architect. We work with architects, engineers, environmental scientists, those people like that. My background is civil engineering, systems ecology, and urban planning, so I'm seriously schizophrenic. Um, and before I start, I'd, I'd really like to just take a short time to give this little anecdote story that I think sets where we're at. And it's, it's not meant to be funny, but it's meant to pontificate without actually looking like I'm doing that, I guess. So there's a, a sparrow and a robin, and they're up north. And this, uh, it's winter's approaching, and the sparrow says to the robin, we better get going, you know. I mean, it's, it's, winter's going to set in, we're going to be in trouble. And the robin says, no sweat, don't worry. I've got it. I know the system. I'll take care of you. I'm your friend. A little while later, a big storm comes in, and it's starting to snow and freeze, and the robin goes, wow, we've got to get out of here. We're in trouble. And they start flying south. And the uh, sparrow says to the robin, Robin, my wings are icing. I'm in trouble. And the robin says, you're on your own. And about that time, the sparrow starts spiraling down out of the sky, and he falls in this really big pile of steamy, moist, wet, soft cow manure. And he's going, man, I'm going to die, and I'm in a pile of manure. And he realizes it's melting his wings, okay, and he's going to be able to live. And he starts to chirp and sing and everything, and a cat comes by and eats him. And um, there's, some, there's some morals to this, okay? And the first moral is, not everybody that says they're your friend is, okay? Secondly, not everybody that tells you they know the system does. And the corollary here is, all models are bad. Some models are useful, okay? Um, another one is that um, every time you fall in a pile of manure, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And the last one is, when you're warm and happy, keep your mouth shut, okay? <laughs> And I'm always scared when somebody asks me to do this because I'm up here starting to sing and, and I'm waiting for this cat. Okay, so, so with that, I'll try to go on. The, there are significant people that have helped us over the years. Peggy and I started doing this. Abdel Nasser Arafat is one of my doctoral students who's now a postdoc at the University of Florida. I like to tease um, Nasser, we call him Nasser, that I'm Dr. Arafat's uh, chair. Okay, and then uh, the other one is Iris Patton, who's now a faculty member at the University of Arizona. And where did I point this? Oh, I'm pointing the wrong thing. Okay. The presentation today, I want to start with a little bit of an understanding about Florida so you know where we're coming from. Talk a little bit about why I believe geodesign is important. Look at the My Region project, which I think helps some of that. Talk to you about what we're doing with uh, LUCIS Plus. LUCIS is the land use conflict identification strategy, and the students came up with this really cool idea of planning land use scenarios. So that's where the plus came from. And now they got land use. W and land use, E for water and energy and stuff like that. And the fun part about being in academics is you allow your students the freedom to, to play. And then uh, what lessons are learned, how geodesign, what the geodesign educational opportunities are in the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning at UF. And then an interesting geodesign problem that I hope I can get to, but I'm classic academic, more slides than I probably should have. So why geodesign? I think it's first and formidably the best solution for this problem that we have that's called disjointed incrementalism. And what disjointed incrementalism does, and I'm going to paraphrase Carl here, and Carl said that, that uh, geodesign is geography changing, changed by design. Well, disjointed incrementalism is geography changed by institutional happenstance. And the incremental changes that occur over time are done so in such a local decision way that with the absence of no regional context. And so what happens is you get what we call Florida sprawl. And by the way, we do Florida sprawl really well. Okay? And what happens is you get this occurring, and you don't know it's occurring until all of a sudden it's there. And to paraphrase Doug Olson yesterday, he might say that, that um, disjointed incrementalism is the vector for the global disease that he was talking about. So what happened? How did we get all started? We did a lot of green waste planning and, and stuff like that. And people started to ask us how land use changed. And then he asked us to take a look at what Florida might look like in 2060. And so we have this way that we, we deal with, and the population was going to go from roughly 18 million people to 30 
six million people um, projections. That's not going to change much. Florida has, the, even with the economic downturns and the and the, the housing market doing what it's doing and everything else, Florida is not going to change that much. There will be something changing, but it, it won't be this idea that people are not coming to the state of Florida for that particular reason. And it's interesting to look at what we did with this is we looked at, at urban densities, but we looked at them a different way. We started to look at gross urban density. We started to look at what the total population was and what the urban footprint was. And how, how could we use that? Could we use that in a, in a very, very large uh, regional context, which was Florida? And the interesting part here is in people per acre, not units per acre, not square foot of, of commercial infrastructure or those kinds of things, people per acre. Alachua County has 1.7 people per acre. Per, in, the, in the urbanized area, 1.7 people per acre, okay? Miami-Dade, I don't know if you've been to Miami, but Miami is pretty dense. Miami-Dade is about 15 people per acre. Orange County is about four. Gilchrist County, a half a person per acre. And if all of a sudden they start, oh, you, you get this spillover and they start developing at a rate, they're developing it at historic rate of a half a person per acre. And you're eating up land like you wouldn't believe. And so what happens is, that's what Florida looks like in 2005. The light blue is water. The green is existing conservation lands. We bought a lot of conservation lands in the state of Florida. And then the brownish red colors are the current development. The 2060 projection looks like that. It pretty well puts to rest that inverted U that is supposed to be the megalopolis that starts in Miami, goes up to I-4, crosses I-4, and comes back down. The whole peninsula is going to be a megalopolis, by the way, this, by, by the turn, unless we do something different. And that means we're going to have to structurally change the way we look at the world and the way we look at government. If you, did what, if you looked at what we did, we actually went from 6 million acres of urban to 13 million acres of urban. We held the conservation lands constant in this model for a reason. They asked us to. They wanted to know what the development would look like on places where they were proposing new conservation lands. And the only way to do that was to look at the modeling structure. So, how does, what is LUCIS? Okay, what does it do? It's a process for land use analysis and population allocation, which comes after the identification, using traditional suitability as, and to try and identify conflicts. So it's essentially a traditional suitability model with some really nice additions, I think. The My Region project was uh, done for East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, and I want to give uh, Phil Lorian, the director of East Central Florida, who's now retired, and Claudia Pascausis, that's a mouthful, um, credit for, for doing a lot of what we did, taking what we did and adding, and adding to it, doing environmental, some environmental analysis, looking at REMI models for uh, economic data and those things. And so the project, to cut it short, because I want to go buy some slides so I can talk more about others, they really believed in this idea that their region was, was developing in this disjointed incremental fashion. That it was a typical sprawling development within the areas, the views was that it was environmentally unhealthy, the urban environment wasn't efficient and wasn't particularly exciting. There was nothing about that urban environment with, with unit after unit after unit with a palm tree and a front yard and some stuff like that that was particularly exciting. Nice weather, not particularly exciting. Of course, if you've been at Florida in July and August, I'm not necessarily sure it's nice weather. Okay. So this, this is what it looked like. And if, if we kept doing, since, 2000, since the year 2000, the region added 300,000 new housing units and over a half a million new residents. And it looked like that. Um, in 2050, and with some of the stuff we looked at, we continue to develop the way we do. We'll have built 2,340,000 new units, single family housing mostly, okay? Um, we'll commit to a pattern of commuter uh, that will double a road network and traffic will get worse. We'll have 344 square miles of sensitive habitat that will be lost to urbanization in just this my region area, and you'll see where that's at in a minute. I apologize for the thing. And we'll consume 2,577 2, additional square miles of urban land. And at the time, we don't know what the heck gas prices are going to be in 2060. We have no idea. My region... Uh, the Strategic Planning Task Force had seven senior members on it, and the regional board had 226 members, as Doug was talking about. You get a chance to interact with people, and these people are real estate agents, they're developers, they're environmental scientists, they're environmentalists, they're planners, they're just interested general public, okay? And if you've ever been in a land use meeting, the four-letter words come flying. 
Okay, when you start to tell somebody that you're not going to allow them to develop or do something on their private property the way they want to do it, you can actually have your life threatened. I was in Monroe County at one time when I was a graduate student. We were working on critical lands of state concern. There were two highway patrols on either side of my, myself and my major professor. And this person came up and said, I'd like to give you both 100 acres of my land. And John said, oh, I can't do that. That's a bribe. And the guy said, no, 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 no. I want you to have 100 acres of my land because I want you to understand what it really means to me for what you're talking about doing. And John said, I'm sorry, uh, we do understand, and, um, but we can't take the land. And he said, in that case, don't come down here because I'll bury you on it. And I went, it, that's a wallet issue. That's a serious, and the, when you're dealing with people's private property and you're doing land use analysis, you're going to deal with some really intense issues. And I think Doug got to that the other day. He had a person screaming. I'm a tenured faculty member at a university. <laughs> I can say it differently, I think. Okay. So what did it look like in 2005? The 2005 snapshot looked like this. Now the color, I took these right out of their report, which by the way, you can go online at uh, eastcentralfloridaregionalplanningcouncil.org or ecfrpc.org and you can get the summary report for this thing. It has a DVD on it too. The urban area is 2,600 square miles. The habitat destroyed during that process was roughly 390. Uh, 394 square miles. That indicator I don't really understand very well. Um, green acres, the green areas was about 2,100 square miles or 24 percent. 34 mile average uh, speed for um, what's commutes. Zero miles of uh, passenger rail, $118 billion of gross regional product in $2,000. And the average wage was about $35,000. And the existing uh, urban density centers looked like this. So that's an area, seven counties. It's Volusia County, Seminole County, Lake County, Orange County, Brevard County, which is where Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy is, um, Polk County, and Highlands, or and, uh, Osceola County, excuse me. And uh, one of the areas of interest to later on is to do here, that, there's a big, huge development that's been proposed down there called Destiny. <laughs> I'm not sure, way out in the middle of nowhere like that, that would be my destiny. <laughs> I hope it's not. But the reality is there is uh, that going on. So I apologize. You now know I am not a designer because there wouldn't be a designer in the world put up a colored map that looked like that. Okay. But what happens is we, we ran the Lucis process and we find out that we get conflicts. And I'll tell you exactly how that's, that's done in a second. But it turns out that white area and the black area is, is preferred for urban use the way we look at it. It's about 18.8% of the area. Agriculture is about 10.2%. Conservation is about 28.7%, and then we deal with minor and major conflicts for a total of about uh, 2,460-some thousand acres of land there, and it's it, in that total area. And so what happens is they began to look at these, these ideas, and we always deal with a trend, because there are no perfect plans. There is no such thing as a perfect plan. If you don't have something to compare it to, so we start off with a trend, and we compare everything we do to the trend to try and figure out what it is we've got. And if you look here, the description of the trend says most development occurs in suburbs, farther from traditional centers, most housing is single story, single family, they're on one third to one half acre lots, there are a few bike paths, and no leafy walking trails, well, no walking trails. People drive to jobs, schools, doctors, stores, and strip malls, we do strip malls really well. The uh, very young and very old have to depend on people to get them around. There are limited bus services. Commuter uh, run miles is, in this scenario was 43 miles from Deland to Kissimmee. Um, there was about 344 square miles of uh, conservation areas that would have been uh, lost sensitive wildlife areas, about the size of Manhattan. Um, we would, the area would uh, increase about 1.7 times um, to the size of Rhode Island, okay? And the, it would double the land area urbanized that started in 1565 with the Native American Indians all the way to 2005. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the economic um, growth in the area doubled to about $421 billion, and the, uh, it would employ roughly 3,768,000 uh, 3, uh, people. So that was the, some of the economic analysis. That's the trend. Now the yellow up here, that yellow, that gray is the existing. The yellow is all the new urban development. And you can see that, that people are beginning to do this. Now once you do that, you start to ask people questions. Is this what you want? And virtually everybody, including even real estate people, do not really want to see that. 
They really don't want sprawl. They want some other way to deal with what's going on. And so what happens is we brought in 3,000 people. We had two visioning games. They put down 65,000 dots of where they thought the density ought to go. And we integrated that to try and come up with these places where density could be. Now, you can game this. There's no doubt about it. And I think Doug would tell you and Carl would tell you. It's easy to game the system. And in fact, you can see that the people that were interested in what was going on down there in, in Destiny um, were gaming the system. So because you bring the, the general public in doesn't mean it's the absolute correct. There is no absolute correct answer. On the other hand, if you bring the people in and you get people involved, and we had this, by the time we were done, it was presented on the regional TV for about four hours. There were, there were uh, general public voting on this kind of thing for the particular scenarios that it, they enjoyed. So the three scenarios were a green area scenario, a center scenario that was, was pretty much cities, towns, and villages, connected by basic rail, okay. And then there was this quarter idea, which was intense uh, light rail, streetcars, commuter rail representations and that. And, and these were just visions of what they would like to see or what they thought they might be interested in. The green area scenario uh, turns out that instead of uh, uh, developing the way it would, the uh, region turned out to have 39% urban and 51% conservation with 10% unde un undeveloped, which was a significant saving. There was uh, 2,483 square miles of proposed new conservation lands and an addition of 4,627 square miles of conservation land, equaling one half the size of the state of Vermont. They really, they really began to want that. This is just the, the green area scenario. It didn't win, by the way. The wildlife routes are preserved. There's green belts. There's connectivity. You can see that the connectivity in the, the dark areas are, are the existing conservation. The light greens are the corridors. Okay. The gray, again, is the same urbanized area. Uh, it turns out that the uh, air quality didn't, didn't get a whole lot better in any one of these scenarios. Uh, in fact, it got worse than 2005. Water consumption was 8% less than the trend. As a result of the increased density in urban areas, there were 200,000 more jobs than the trend, and the ec economic value was $448 billion worth of gross regional product, which is 6%, 6.5% larger than the trend, and there were 3,966,000 employees or employment. And the, the urban areas began to look like that. The dent, they became denser, obviously. So we did the same thing with the center scenario. And the center scenarios, uh, they began to work with this idea of where would they want centers. And as you can see, uh, Destiny didn't win out as one of the centers. But the other places began to, to say, we would really like to be urbanized areas. And when we looked at this, the development it got, got denser. It grew vertically as well. Um, in the Garden Cities areas, their green belt conservation, 4,198 square miles, or 47% of the region was still in greenways. Um, air quality was 17.5% better, and the water consumption was 8% less. So it didn't change the water consumption much. Uh, people were, you had biking, you had transit opportunities, those kinds of things. The total employment was 4,123. A thousand people, and there were, which is 355,000 more, and the gross domestic product was 4. 460 billion dollars. Now I'm doing this rapidly. I understand that, but that's what happens in 35-minute presentations. And the the center areas look like this in terms of their densities. So then they went and said, okay, let's look at the quarters. And the quarters turned out to have a massive amount of transit, which wasn't realistic, but they the the, the 226 people wanted to see what that would look like. So transit uh, is the transportation backbone of the region in this scenario. Cities are encouraged to create taller one-third mile of transit stops, um, taller development within one-third miles of transit stops. Many vacant strip centers became new, new town centers. Uh, there is 413 mile system of commuter rails, light rails, and that. That's an incredible amount of rail, to, to say the least. The average person spends 1.3 hours per day in the car, which is less than what was going on at 1.5 hours per day in the car with, with the, the trend. Residential side streets generally remained intact. The buildings were taller. Neighborhoods looked in the similar to the centers, but were more likely. So this is sort of a their idea at the time of a really mass transit TOD operation. 
Because the urban footprint is denser along the rail lines, the amount of urban land consumed from 2005 to 2050 is just 660 square miles. It's not in the thousands. We cut it into basically someplace in the range of about a third. Um, the region is 36% urban. Total conservation land is 3,816 square miles. And there's 42% of the region. 21% of the region remains undeveloped. Air quality is 9% better. Water is 9% less. Consumption is 9%. The economy is stimulated uh, by the ease of moving people. More affordable housing choices are in the mix of land uses. The gross domestic product is $513 billion. 22% more than the trend, and there are 4,225,000 employees, employment, for the same number of people. The urban centers, clearly you can see, and that's Orlando in the center right there. That's Orlando in the center. Well, it turns out that they then went back and they started to look at the results, and what they found out was in this blue, this light blue here is always going to be the trend. They calculated some acres wrong, so I hit them, so I, I covered up their mistake. Um, so what happens is you have a population of 3,500,000 to start with, you end up with 7,123,000 people in the region when you're done. Uh, the developed or committed urban lands it, in existing is 2,600 acres. The trend is 5,000 acres. The green areas is 3,500 acres. The centers is 3,400 acres. And the quarters is 3,200 acres. Um, again, you can see along the way in terms of the um, number of persons per acre is 2.15 at this time, and it increases from 2.15 to 3.15 to 3.22 to 3.44. Not a huge amount of, of people per acre in, in gross urban density. Um, the environmental indicators, it turns out, again, that uh, conservation lands, there was 2,144. The trend didn't add any existing conservation lands. And by the way, the state of Florida has just stopped its uh, land purchase at this particular time because of the economy, so they really aren't buying lands now. Uh, the Green Acres has 4,600. Uh, the Centers has uh, 4,200. And the Quarters has 3,800. So it has less conservation lands. Again, if you look at uh, what's going on in terms of threatened and endangered species habitat areas, there was 394. That's an additional 344 square miles. Instead, it went to 44, 45, and 28. We didn't, by the way we developed, the pattern that we chose to help them develop with and the pattern they chose that we helped implement or model, uh, reduced the loss of endangered species biodiversity habitat uh, that supported endangered species, wetlands, any number of other things. I think uh, it was Doug the other day said about wetlands. It turns out, he's, um, why would a farmer drain a wetland? Well, in Florida, it's not necessarily a farmer. We've got lands that are called agricultural lands not zoned for agriculture. Interesting title, right? What, what does that mean? That means as an agricultural person, I can clear the wetland, okay? Then I can develop it, <laughs> okay? So you can't develop... You, you can't clear wetlands in Florida to do development, but you can clear wetlands in Florida for agricultural use. And so what happens is there's now a code in the property parcel data set that says agricultural lands not zoned for agriculture. Or if you want to leave your lands in agriculture and collect an agricultural exemption, okay, there's a, a place in this area, and it's called the Villages. It's an incredibly interesting place for retirement. Everybody's driving around with their gator flags and their Auburn flags and their Harvard flags. I don't think they do Harvard flags, okay, but, but what happens is they're driving around their golf carts with these flags and everything else, and they're golfing and doing all this stuff, and they're incredible. they got the biggest real estate uh, program in the nation, and they bring people in, and they're developing a man who owns 24 square miles down there, and he's got a couple of square miles down there with a buffalo on each of the square miles, and he gets an agricultural exemption, okay, to defer the costs. Um, transportation indicators, okay, that... The one I think that's interesting here, you can, I'll be glad to go over this, but I think it's more important to look at the cost of what adding that new, um, all those new rail in, okay? The trend, um, no outer beltway, and with some um, 43 miles of that, is $22 billion worth of, and this, you notice, I think this is the 2000, this is 2060, or 2050. There's $22 billion worth of development. In the green areas, there's $34 billion worth of development for the new roads, okay, and uh, the new uh, transit 
opportunities or the new transit. The centers has uh, 44 billion and the quarters has 44 billion. So in other words, that big jump in the economic indicators that we were talking about, okay, didn't all occur because they were building rail. So there were new jobs that were created that were permanent jobs, not jobs created to just generate rail. But there was a significant amount of, of economic opportunity that occurred in building the rail and then clearly there is a private sector investment that goes all on long rail that's unbelievable. In fact, all you have to do is look at Portland, Oregon and they've got a couple billion dollars worth of private sector investment along their, their rail areas. Uh, again, some indicators, the average speed, you notice uh, the trend is, is basically 33 miles per hour. The, uh, I mean, the, today is 33. The trend is uh, 21, 21, 25, and 23. It doesn't change that much. Because the, the urban area, the, the most amazing places in the world, New York, Paris, San Francisco, Boston, they're congested because they're cities. Cities are congested. Some of the most creative places are congested. The solution, in my opinion, and here's the academic in me, is not to go try to figure out how to do new roads, but let's get some mass transit in here, and you're still not going to decrease the congestion because cities are going to be congested. It's, it's, the, it's the way that cities work. That doesn't mean they have to be bad. Okay? That doesn't mean you can't get to where you work faster or those kinds of things. It depends on your mode choice for how you want to get there. Uh, the economic and water indicators, okay, 1,700 million gallons a day on the trend, 1,570 uh, million gallons a day for the green acres, 1,560 and 1,550. The water consumption doesn't change that much. That's going to require other kinds of technology. It doesn't change based on the land uses as much. So population projections. This was really interesting because it, it started a general discussion that some people would actually be better doing the sprawl than they would be in, in doing the other alternatives. And so what happens, if you look at Brevard County, under the, pro, the Bieber moderate projections, by 2050, they would have 932,000 people. The Green Acres was 914. The Centers would be 958. They would go up because they have an attraction of more. The Quarters would be 967. And the trend would be 888. They wouldn't actually get as much in the trend. They would begin to attract, because of the Centers, attract development, attract some people, attract job opportunities, and attract um, um, other activities based on the fact that they were developing in some center particular strategy. So how does Lucis work? Now, I showed you what it is. That we won a national award for best, best use of technology by a university, and my region won best use of technology by a regional planning organization, or planning organization from the APA for that project. And so uh, Lucis really is not, it's, and uh, Peggy, <laughs> um, Peggy is an incredibly interesting person. I wanted to call it Lucas, L-U-C-A. S for land use conflict analysis strategy. Peggy wanted to call it land use conflict identification strategy. You know who wins in these discussions, okay? I, I've been married 40 years. I'm well trained, okay? Um, I, I tease my students, I have a magic wallet. Money shows up in it. I have my wife's an accountant. I have absolutely no idea where, where any of our investments are or anything like that. You know? yeah, I'm the reverse. If she dies, I don't know where to go. There's a, there's a safe and I'm supposed to go in there and do something, okay? So, the Lucis project, we, we start by developing goals, objectives, and sub-objectives, and we model those. We model suitability reflecting those goals, objectives, and sub-objectives. We create preference from suitability, I'll show you how to do that. We either normalize or transform that preference into a way that we can, we, we collapse it into categories of high, medium, and low, and then we use those collapsed preferences to help us identify land use conflict and land use alternatives, or land use opportunities as well. So, um, here's just some example, okay? So with a, a sub-objective, three goals. We have these three major goals for greenfield development. We look at agriculture, we look at conservation, we look at urban. The, depending upon where we're at, conservation might actually be titled ecological significance because people do not like to hear the word conservation. I'm not exactly sure why, they just don't like to, to have it that way. So rather than argue about a minuscule point, we change it. But I work with doctoral students. And so you'll notice that that process is in alphabetic order, agriculture, conservation, and urban. That way they can't forget it, <laughs> okay? So when we're dealing with these numbers, the reality is keep it the KISS method, method, keep it simple. And so we model things like multifamily use. We model single family use. 
We model commercial, retail, service, industrial, institutional, entertainment. That's just in the urban area. We model biodiversity, species biodiversity, habitat biodiversity, surface water, underground water. Um, we model connectivity, habitat connectivity. In agriculture, we look at the various different forms of agriculture, including the orchards, including high in intensity uh, uh, like cattle and pigs, uh, chickens. We, we model low intensity, the horses, the horse farms we have and those kinds of things like that. We model the, each and every one of those. There's 500 different models, I think, in this. Uh, and by the way, it's not, it's going to be easier to use than it actually is right now. What problem with working with doctoral students. Okay. The suitability uh, for the goals then, and that's, there's one of our models. I like, I like our, we, we decided to have our models go from bottom to top because everybody else's goes from left to right, okay? And I'm at a university, and I can't figure out how to go from the left to the right. It just never, I don't do that very well. So what, I, that must have missed everybody, okay? Yeah, I don't go conservative, okay? So, so what happens is we model this, and this is the noise for single family. And when, what you look at is we're looking at airports, the regional parcels, what kind of parcels might generate noise? Active rail, interstates, major roads, power plants, Water treatment facilities, sewer treatment facilities. This is a deterministic model. This is not a stochastic model. I don't know how many times I've gone into a land use meeting and I've said, in fact, we'll do it right here. How many of you would like to live next to a prison? Oh my God. <laughs> how many of you would like to live next to a prison? Uh, how many would like to live next to a sewage treatment plant? Uh, right? You run a stochastic model, those are going to come up not significant. Nobody in here except Carl said he would like to live next to a prison, okay? I would suggest that's a significant variable, and the way to deal with it is, is these deterministic models. So now I'm going to have to go real fast because I have five minutes. That's what that model looks like, and it turns out that up in Seminole County, there's a lot more noise. So we look at the standard stuff. Oops. We look at the standard stuff, hazards, air quality, floods, to do the physical, and we weight those kinds of weighted suitability models. We do the same thing for uh, prisons, entertainment, water and sewer facilities, okay? Existing single family, retail, environmental amenities, and this is a single family model that I'm dealing with. Major roadways and services. And we weigh those. And then we look at the existing land uses. What, what land use is good for single family residential? In Florida, agriculture. But some agriculture isn't. If you're raising palm trees, that's a very, very valuable land, especially if you're putting those palm trees as part of the landscaping for the various single-family residential properties that are current. We model the density. We look at three, three decades of density. We model a historic growth over a three-decade period of time. And then we take this, the physical, the proximal, the existing land uses, the density, and the growth history, and we turn that into an existing category. Next. We take the stakeholders and we ask them to help us, and then they, they help us determine what's important among those categories. This is those people in the, in the committees. This isn't experts. This is the 3,000 people or the people who are beginning to work on, on, that you're beginning to work with. And when we're done with that, if this goes forward, you get an urban category. Now we have urban, we have agriculture, and we have um, conservation. We also have single family residential, multifamily residential. We have all those available. And so what happens now is we can collapse those. And one way to collapse those is you can just do these natural breaks. You can collapse what you've got in that raster, we rest, raster and vector. You can use natural breaks. You can use manual method. You can use equal intervals. I've become a, a proponent of equal intervals. I used to be a proponent of standard deviation, but I've, I've become a huge proponent of the equal intervals. It keeps everything in the same scale much better. Um, when you get done with it, you take this kind of a thing and you begin to drop it into three categories, where the green is high, uh, preference, the yellow is low preference and the red is, I mean the yellow is moderate preference and the red is low preference. And so that's what a natural break looks like and you can see, see between those three, just trying to give you this idea, it does matter how you do it. The next part of this is we identify the conflict and this is the very, this is simple. It requires math. Anything you do with rasters requires some kind of math. So we take the ag categories of 3, 2, 1 and multiply them times 100. This is graduate level PhD math. Okay. You take the 3, 2, 1, you multiply it by 100. For the, act, for the conservation, okay, it's ACU. You take the, the 3, 2, 1, you multiply it by 10, and the urban, you leave it alone. Now you add them all together, and you end up with numbers that look like 3, 3, 3. That's a high preference in all three of those categories. That's conflict. Okay. 
where you get a three, two, one, you have a high agricultural preference, a moderate conservation preference, and a low urban preference. Okay? Probably not going to develop really quickly. So you end up with 27 categories. I'm not going to go through all of them, okay? but what happens is you can see that that gives you a really, really flexible way to look at things on very incrementally small areas. The next one is you try to keep it in the same category. So now you're looking at commercial, multifamily, and retail for mixed-use opportunity, and you can do exactly the same thing. So now inside of urban areas, we can begin to look at what we've got for mixed-use opportunities using exactly the same plan. And I love the one one ones. Everybody goes, why the one one ones? Yeah, it's a major conflict, but nobody cares about it. Okay? It's the th and, or a major opportunity, and nobody wants to be there. 333 three, three is a high preference. If I'm looking for mixed use, that 333 three, three is a really good place. So one of the things we do next is we start to do the scenario development. And our scenario development turns around and says, let's look at the mixed use redevelopment. And we, the students love these ideas. Well, it turns out, I guess, the dashboards are these spreadsheets too. And so what happens now is we create spreadsheets. And we'll do something like use census blocks and transportation analysis zones, because the person who was from California the other day got up and did this presentation and said, I have to know stuff in these really little areas. Well, I, we have to be able to summarize it back up. So all this locational stuff helps us summarize it back up. The next thing we do is we add in that conflict. Right over here is the conflict. And we add in the, the suitability levels. And after the suitability levels, we can add in the acres that we're working with and the actual parcel acres. We have parcel IDs, so we can flip back and forth between the actual vector uh, data sets as well as the raster data sets. And from there, we use this, this uh, allocation by year and population employment. We can allocate employment. We can allocate population. We can do it by year. We have gross urban densities and those kinds of things. So we jump into the spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet's pretty interesting because it's got 5.5 million records. So you've got some real interesting suitability out there, and you've got it at a small scale. And I got a feeling I'm about ready to go off, so. Here's the redevelopment mask. I'm gonna go for one more minute. I'm just, I'm gonna pull Carl and go, stop it, okay, so. And what happens is now I can look inside the redevelopment areas for the mixed use, and that right there is redevelopment commercial. This is redevelopment retail. That's redevelopment multifamily. You put them all together, and I want you to look, oops, I want you to look at this area it's right in here, okay? The redevelopment retail, the multifamily, and right here, you can see there's those points. It automatically comes along and tells you where, where your mixed use opportunities are best. We put it together with Greenfield. That's what the trend looked like with the 7.1 million. We, this is a composite. They, they, they couldn't do the, the rail, all that rail, so they asked us to put together the composite. We put it together the way I just described, we did the next one, and it turns out we put seven million people on one quarter of the area. We saved the entire uh, ecological plan, and we never even really did the, had to run into conflict with any of the ecological areas. Now, if you go to a land use meeting, and you walk into that meeting, and that large developer has that land out there, and you go, we just saved that, all that development on the land you wanted to develop, they're not necessarily happy. Do you want me to quit? OK. Um, this is a very interesting mix. We can take that and try to figure out what, what would be the mix when you did it. So this idea of, of, if you believe in suitability, we have commercial, retail, and multifamily, we can come up with what a commercial mix looks like. Look at this area, this area, and this area. That's the commercial percentage. That's the retail percentage. That's the multifamily percentage. So watch this right here. That's, retail, that's multifamily. It's not really good for retail, but it's really good for commercial. There's commercial office place and mixed use residential opportunity in that whole entire area right there. And we know what percentages that, that development might, might look at. This is um, a new way of doing the proximity. Those are all the multifamily units in the, the area. That's all the commercial op opportunity. There's all the transit centers on the rail, I mean not on the rail, on the bus routes, okay? And we now look at walkability to those areas, and then we do network analysis to come up with network accessibility from multifam all the multifamily units to all the commercial activity. That's built into the model. And so, lessons learned, and this is where I'll stop for you. Regional urban form can be uh, 
determined using GIS. It really is a, a matter of using technology. Regional geodesign models can produce results that are summarized to local areas, making geodesign proactive, flexible, and community-based. And I took that directly from your work. Existing land use plans can be compared to multiple regional geodesign scenarios and assist decision makers. Regional geodesign allows the development of policy alternatives that do not restrict design creativity. I'm going to say something affectionately here about architects because I'm an associate dean in a program that has a lot of architects. But landscape architects and almost all designers, and you're out there, are the same. The, most of those schools are called schools of architecture. Okay? So that's SOA. Okay? Well, anybody ever watch the program Sons of Anarchy? If you've ever been in an architecture faculty meeting, it, it, you're not going to go to a designer and say, here, here's a form base. I want it to look this way. It's not going to happen. You have to allow them the creativity to practice their profession, but you have to have some kind of regional context that guides that. This process, I think, or hopefully this process, is useful in that particular method. Planners and urban designers can analyze and identify important regional parameters and still allow designers the freedom to create um, exciting urban spaces. And regional geodesign has the potential to change our antiquated, disjointed incremental development policies. And if we do that, we've done a really big thing in just in geodesign as it is. Thank you. <laughs>